Good afternoon, everyone. So today we are doing this workshop on the role of technology in open education. This week here at MUN and all over the world, the Open Education Week is being celebrated in which uh, the idea is to promote the uh, to making the education open and the resources open to everyone. So let me share my screen so that you can see. So this is the the website here at the MUN of all the events that we are organizing at MUN during that workshop. And tomorrow there is another workshop on H5P. So today we are going to talk about the role of education, role, role of technology. So first let me go through what open education resources is. Like loosely it's just like teaching, learning and research resources that through the permission of the creator you can allow others to use or distribute. And the technology has a key role in that because essentially you can reach more, uh, more audience for your teaching resources in minimal cost. So there are various technologies that you can use in terms of delivery of your lectures or creating your lectures. And these are the bunch of technologies that have been uh, investigated at CITL. If you click on any of these, it will give you take you to the uh, learning technology guide where you can see the overview of most of these technologies. And we have collected most of them which are which have a free version or have a license through one. So you can go through them and use them in your lectures. So coming back to the uh, today's workshop today, we are planning to give you an overview of uh, one of one of a free and open source technology called Hypothesis. And Asita will give you a presentation on that tool. And later we'll have uh, Dr. David uh, give a lecture, uh, speak upon his experience with these lectures. Thank you very much, Shiva. And uh, I'm going to share my screen with you all. Yeah, great. And Hypothesis is the free open technology that we are going to talk about today. Before that, I start talking about um, hypothesis. I would like to define or explain annotation. Annotation is kind of a note added by way of comment or explanation in a document or piece of information. Annotations helps to increase uh, reading comprehension strategies and helping students to develop a deep understanding and critical thinking about the course materials. You have seen uh, students highlight passages in books in order to refer back key places uh, easily. Digital annotation allows you to write down the idea or the understanding of reading as highlighted parts in your own way. Hypothesis is such a digital annotation tool that helps to annotate in more attractive manner. Here is the simple outline that we are going to talk about today. Uh, under what is hypothesis, we will talk about uh, the definition. Under the second heading, we will talk about how does hypothesis work. After that, we will talk about why hypothesis is good for the education and examples of use and benefits, and finally, the references. Hypothesis is uh, an open source annotation technology that enables its users to annotate anywhere in the web. It is simply an annotation tool for learning and teaching. Anyone can annotate with text, links, images, or even with uh, videos. Okay, now uh, Shivan will take over from here and give you a demonstration of how the hypothesis works. After that, we will discuss why hypothesis is good for the education. Let's, for example, you have in your, in your classroom, you have this project to read a book online, which is available online. And instead of just going through reading it all by yourself, what you can do is, let's say you, you copy this link and you go over to this website, Hypothesis, and you simply paste the link here. And click on annotate. So what will it open up is, it will open the same exact page in the Hypothesis service. What it will add is, if there are any of the annotations, of the other people who are reading the same text as you are reading. And it opens up all these resource of whatever 
people are learning from that text and added added their learnings and knowledge through this annotating tool uh, on this on their servers. So what you can do is you how to use it. You simply click on any of the text on which you want more explanation or you want to add your own thoughts on that. You click on annotate and simply you can add the text here. And it's a simple markdown tool where you can add more images, videos, or format your text accordingly. And you just post it to public. So all this, all the learnings that you have done is available for everyone on, on the public platform for anyone to see or reply to it. So in that way, you can engage with other people who are doing the same thing. Moreover, you can also create, uh, let me show you another example where people are using it in their classrooms. So here, people are reading uh, this text where they have annotated, as well as they can use a tag very specific to their course so that the instructor or the students can see all of the comments made by their peers in the classroom. So, and if you click on any of the tag, it will show you all of these annotations from that website or other websites in a single page. And Asita will go over more over like how to use it in your classroom or as a student during your study. So let me put the screen back for Asita. All right. Uh, the next question is uh, why hypothesis good for the education? You know, reading is a fundamental learning activity, even in the subject like mathematics. There are course materials to follow lots of reading per semester assume you are an instructor then you might have these questions actually are the students reading do they understand what they are reading and are they sharing the ideas with peers yes hypothesis answer all these questions one can think hypothesis is a social annotation tool Yes, it is more likely a social media for the education because Hypothesis is an online tool that enables students to collaboratively annotate course readings and their internet resources while being fully engaged with their peers. Hypothesis makes reading active. It helps to actively engage each and everyone in the class in an attractive manner. For an example, you can share your thoughts uh, ideas as an image or as an animated video. Hypothesis makes reading visible. The visibility of your annotation helps to engage with one another and shares different thoughts in different things. For instance, suppose you have a group activity, then everyone can visibly involve. Hypothesis makes reading social. One can say that uh, hypothesis is my literary Facebook. It brings the feeling that you are not alone. You can confirm the understanding of reading with your peers. And next, uh, I want to show you some examples of classroom use. Uh, you can annotate uh, web pages. Uh, for instance, um, digital writing assistant web page like uh, Bartleby.com and uh, also, you can annotate, annotate on uh, internet-based encyclopedia pages like Wikipedia. I can uh, show you a few annotations done by using uh, hypothesis. Yeah, you can see a few annotations. And simply like Shiva mentioned, you can highlight it by uh, text that you want to annotate and just simple click the annotation annotate icon and just write the things you want you can add links you can add images or you can write equations because this is uh, uh, this is uh, latex supported and also you can annotate a uh, google documents but first you have you have to publish on web and then you can annotate also you can annotate journal articles and you can annotate uh, 
on online software like Pressbook. Pressbook is an online software that enables to design and format any kind of books. So I can click on that and show you how the annotation works. See, there are a lot of annotations. And again, yes, you can annotate free open sources like uh, WordPress. WordPress helps you to host and build website or blogs. So here is an example of a college student annotating a professor's literary anthology using a WordPress plugin. So like before, as Shiva mentioned, you can select the text that you want to annotate and click the annotate icon. Likewise, you can do whatever annotate here. Okay, and then I want to discuss uh, the benefits as a student and as an instructor. Of course, uh, Hypothesis is a free resource. It is uh, the most valuable benefit as a student can get. Also, students can benefit from the input and comments of other students. Not only that, students can get benefit from outsiders as well. Students can post questions to which anyone can respond. Also, students can be actively involved. As an instructor, can guide their students uh, reading asynchronously and pre-submit a text uh, questions for students. Also annotate as questions, important points, or independent study. There are more benefits as an instructor. Suppose you have a large class, you can be divided into small groups and give some works on hypothesis. Yeah, here are some schools that are already using hypothesis around the world. There are so many universities, but I just picked some of them to show you. You can see at the University of Cape Town from South Africa. And yeah, few universities around the world. And here I added few references and we will post the links in the Man Open Education website. And you can uh, get all the information from there. Yes, finally, uh, it's time for the questions. Thank you, Shivam. Thank you, Asitha. I was just wondering, David, if you have ever used that and if you have, like, what would be your feedback and maybe your students have used it. I haven't used it myself before. I've, I've heard a lot of good things about it, but I uh, don't know anybody personally who has experience with it at all. I don't uh, give a lot of links online uh, as references, so I, I wouldn't be able to use it in my courses. Um, Mostly I give like documents like PDFs of my slides or the things that I've said in my lectures or like live coding sort of thing. So um, <clears throat> I think for things that are not necessarily computer science, it would be maybe a little bit more helpful, um, but I, I haven't used it in any of my courses. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's especially nice for the, for most of the readings things. Like also like if you, if the instructors have like their own lecture notes, they could like as long as it's hosted somewhere openly on the on the web, like you could use like uh, WordPress or any of those hosting websites to host the notes, and then students can like annotate it using this tool. But again, like it comes into how much of the lecture notes are in the open domain. And and they also have like. Uh, a version for LMS, like for for example, Brightspace and D2L, so that we wouldn't necessarily have to uh, put out the lecture notes out in the open. It could just only be hosted on the D2L, as long as our D2L has installed those uh, the hypothesis tool for that. So for the next, we have uh, Dr. David from uh, Department of Computer Science, and he will tell us about his experience with the using technologies during his lectures. Sure. So um, <clears throat> it may be helpful if you can possibly 
maximize my webcam uh, somehow, I think you can change the layout to be stack or something like that. So the current person who is talking um, is, is, uh, is a little bigger. And the reason for that is not because of my face, but I'm going to be using um, a technology to show you what I do for my courses. So just a quick introduction. I'm David Churchill. I'm an associate professor in computer science. And since March of 2020, uh, when the COVID forced us all online, I've been uh, teaching online and live streaming my lectures on Twitch, um, which is a, sort of a known for its gaming um, streaming, but some people use it for education and programming and game development and stuff like that. So I thought um, technologies like WebEx and Zoom, they're good enough for meetings like this, but I find that they're lacking in their ability to integrate with other software. So for example, uh, the software that I'm going to talk about a little bit, I'm not going to give a tutorial on how to set it up. There's lots of excellent tutorials on YouTube for stuff like that. But uh, it's called Open Broadcasting Software, or OBS. And um, it's a piece of software that allows you to um, set up different scenes and broadcast those scenes online. So for example, I'm using OBS right now and hopefully this works, but I've got it set up so that I have, um, I'm creating like a fake webcam uh, with OBS and I should be able to switch scenes and you'll be able to see that. So for example, um, if I go over here and share my middle monitor, so right now you should be able to see, I mean, the font may be a little bit small, but you can see that I'm now like sharing my monitor and I've got sort of this picture in picture webcam up here in the, in the top right hand side of the screen. And so if I'm trying to teach, uh, I can switch back and forth really easily between my webcam, uh, between my programming. I can now, okay, let's, let's run the game that I've been teaching kids how to program and here's the game running um, in, in full screen with the webcam and so people can see that, that instant feedback um, with the programming. Uh, also, uh, let's see here. So I can pull up my presentation. So my presentation is here, or I can switch that if I go into presenter mode, then now I have the, the full screen presentation um, on the screen. So all of these uh, scenes are, you know, you can set them up really easily. Now I'm sharing the, um, let me go back to the middle monitor here. So I've got all this set up. Uh, so that I have a, a device called a stream deck, which allows me to, to uh, change back and forth with the scenes. Here's a, another fun little scene here. I've got a, a little blackboard set up. So I'm over uh, at the podium here and I can, you know, make a little graph or play X's or O's. Um, so this is a little blackboard um, switching be, uh, between all that. And then uh, another thing I like to do, you can have a little bit of fun with this. So for example, I've got like, um, uh, my pet slideshow so I can show uh, my pets to my students or um, let's see here I've got like funny scenes like this person is reacting to me now or I can have um, when my class is starting so this is uh, the scene that I have when the class is starting it uh, so people can to they have a few minutes to tune in before the lecture starts because of course if you just start right on time there won't be uh, many students in the room uh, right away. So you can have something like that. Or if I have to step away because one of my pets is acting up, I have little scenes like be right back. Or you can have a little bit of fun uh, with the webcam and a green screen. So let's see if I can I can find this. Uh, so here I am. I'm on the beach in a, in a cell phone or something like that. I, I find this one pretty funny too. So here's like someone watching me on an iPad. Uh, just like, you know, you can do basically whatever you want with this and it's a lot more interactive and immediate than, than using software um, just like WebEx with basic background filters and stuff like that. So switch back here to the camera. Um, this software, if I try and share the software, you're probably going to get um, this effect happen. So here is the actual open broadcasting software. And of course, there's no way to avoid this sort of infinite recursion while I'm still using the software, right? But you can see here that um, I do have different scenes down here that I can switch between. You have uh, volume controls, you can record locally, you can stream to um, whatever website you want. Um, and so all the scenes are down here. You can control like your volume. It's almost like a little mini recording studio in, in, your, in, your, in your home or 
in your office or wherever you set this up. Uh, so uh, one thing I can actually do, if I go back here, is I can share the, the website for this. So obsproject.com is where you can get OBS Studio. And uh, you can see here the, the software is available for any major operating system, so Windows, Mac, OS X, or Linux. And you can just download it and you can start editing scenes to your heart's content. Um, and it's, it's really easy to use. Uh, it's used by pretty much every, every major uh, streamer out there. So you can broadcast live to Twitch, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, like I said, you can record locally. So what I do for my classes is I will start the class and I'll, I'll just show you what I do here. So I have this, uh, this schedule that I open up for the class that I'm teaching. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. And so what I normally do is I, I start the stream and I have the schedule for the class and I say, okay, this is the current lecture that we're going to be doing today. And then I take some Q&A and then with the same open broadcasting software that lets me stream it, I can start recording the version of the lecture that I want to be on YouTube. So maybe there's some pre-roll stuff or, or like, you know, you, you greet the, the class uh, that you don't want to be on the recorded video um, that goes up to YouTube. I can say, okay, now I'm going to start the video. And then I say, hello, welcome to class, blah, blah, blah. And then I finish the lecture and I, and I stop the recording. And then that recording is what ends up on YouTube. And I don't need to use external video editing software or, or anything like that. Um, so then I go straight into the lecture and, and it's, it's really easy. Uh, it has a little bit of a learning curve to, to set up, but once you get going, uh, it's not so bad. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about OBS. It lets you um, do all sorts of cool stuff really instantaneously uh, once you've taken you know, an hour or two to learn the software. Um, and the second thing, uh, is anyone else gonna talk about GitHub just a little bit or no? Was that no, no, not today. Because I want to, yeah, I just wanted to show, I'm not giving an, uh, a tutorial on GitHub, but I, I just wanted to show uh, one little thing since I have a little bit of time um, to, to explain what I do in my courses. So for anyone who's, uh, who's not a programmer out there, uh, this, uh, this is a website called GitHub that uh, allows for you to host mostly software projects. But um, let me go to, to the home page of GitHub. But pretty much anything that uses um, small text-based files. So if you were writing a novel, for example, you could host that on GitHub. You wouldn't want to use GitHub for something like having a lot of photos or lar large binary data like videos, for example, but anything text-based you can. So I actually, um, if you're teaching at MUN, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, D2L, the online learning system that we have. Um, D2L is really great for submitting, um, submitting small assignments and for um, giving marks and stuff like that. But what D2L is not really great at is something like software, where you may have students frequently making changes um, to their code. And if they make one little change to their code, for example, let's say they have a project that's uh, maybe 15 megabytes in size and all they want to do is like change their name on the project, then they're going to have to re-upload the entire project with just that one line of code changed. And so what I've done for my courses, um, for my projects, I actually have students submit um, their projects on GitHub. So they just log in, uh, they sign up for a free account, they make a um, private repository, um, which is just uh, a place on GitHub where they can store files privately so that their assignments are not viewable to everyone else in the class, for example. And what you can do as a professor or as any sort of teacher um, or TA is you can set up um, what's called a template repository. So this template repository that I have here is for the project in my course, which is Computer Science 4303. So um, especially in programming, uh, but in a lot of courses as well, ideally, if you have a, a project or an assignment which is going to consist of a bunch of different files, like a programming project may have a hundred different files in it. And if everyone in the class submits their files in a different way with a different structure, it can actually be really difficult to navigate that as a professor or as a TA when you go to market. So what I've done here is I've set up for their project 
uh, a template repository and they can just come here and click use this template. So if, if a student logs on and sees this, they can click use this template and then they can create their own repository on their GitHub account and then they'll add me as a collaborator on that account and then I'll be able to view that along with the TA and you can click here and you can make it private. And what happens is uh, once you fill this out, which I'm not gonna do right now, you say create repository from template. And then what you get is actually a copy of what I have here. And what I've set up here in this repository is, um, is a bunch of folders um, which have some files in them and some structure that I want them to actually use for their project. So for example, if I scroll down, uh, each GitHub project has a readme file and I give instructions here on, on how to actually set this up. Then uh, they're going to edit this because they get a full copy of this. They'll edit it to have their group member and student number and email. Uh, their project is eventually going to have a YouTube video associated with it. So they'll have a, a presentation that they upload to YouTube and a trailer and a demo. All those will be uploaded to YouTube. And what I found in the past is that some people will have, they'll submit a text file with a link or they'll submit a separate assignment on D2L that has the links to the YouTube or they like message me on Discord with the links and it's all over the place. So I just made sure that all the information that I want them to submit is in this very exact format. And also the folders are labeled with the dates that everything is due. So for example, I think tomorrow the project proposal is due. So what they do is after they've cloned this, there's a proposal.txt in this folder. So they would just open this and they, it just says edit this to contain your project proposal. And then when they commit that back to GitHub, I'll see the changes and then I can read their proposal. Similarly, when they go to do their project setup, um, there's a screenshot that I want them to have. So they would replace this image with their image and whatever code that was used to generate that. And then for their final project, I actually have a specific um, format that I want their folders and code to have this specific structure. And so they can follow that because now they have all that file, all those files and structure that, uh, that exactly what I want them to have. So rather than, you know, give them a text file or a video that explains how to set this up on their own, because they will inevitably fail at setting it up on their own. And I'll have to ask a bunch of questions. You can just set up these templates and have the students use the templates so that um, they would have to drastically screw something up in, other, in order to not have this because it's, all, it's literally already created for them. Um, also, if they've, uh, this uh, Git allows you to like ignore certain files. So if they have large files like zip files or movie files or something they've created, it will just ignore all of that stuff and it'll allow you to set up all these rules for, for project submission. So if you have large projects in engineering or maybe even mathematics, physics, computer science, where there's gonna be code involved or a bunch of different files, I would highly recommend something like Git, uh, especially GitHub, which is a free website that allows you to host Git projects because it's really widely available. There are tutorials available for it. Um, there's lots of software. You can access it from your phone if you need to make a quick change right before the due date. Um, and all around, it's just, it's the industry standard, right? So you might as well, especially for computer science students, you might as well get them used to um, to GitHub soon because it's gonna be their, their professional life um, coming up pretty soon. So that's all I wanted to show about um, GitHub, but just those two, tech, two technologies, um, uh, OBS for all the video production stuff and setting up scenes and being able to switch really rapidly between say uh, code or programming and then running a game and then switching over to a presentation or to a Blackboard view. I, I think it's actually easier than teaching in person. And when you record that and you upload that, it's, you know, you don't have to spend all this time in like in movie maker editing scenes together and switching back and forth. You can just do that all live. Like nothing I just did was, was pre-recorded. Um, so yeah, and, and then there's GitHub, which I think is, is really great for um, medium to large project man management sort of things. But if you, if you don't have a large project, if they're just writing an essay for you, just have them submit it on D2L and I'm, I'm sure it will be fine. So that's all I wanted to say. And if, if anyone has any questions or, or comments, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, David. That was great. Uh, 
and I've seen those uh, scenes before mm -hmm. <laughs> in your lecture, and I, I think they're pretty cool. I, I especially like the like the time it saves, like to smoothly not having to share the screen and like just smoothly you're from video to lectures and like to your presentations. Yeah, you um, don't have to go through that whole thing of okay, give me thirty seconds and <laughs> start sharing my screen now, or I'm gonna like this. Is it in power? Like, is it working? Can you see this? Like, I actually have three monitors set up. So while I was doing that, uh, the WebEx call was on the right monitor, my programming and web browser was on the middle monitor, and the OBS where I can actually see the scenes are on the on the left monitor. So it's it's quite a bit of investment uh, in terms not only of like the time it takes to learn how to do all that, but um, you know there's a hardware investment as well. It would be very difficult to do what I just did with a single monitor, for example. So if you are going to be using this software, you really need a second monitor. And if if you are in any way, short, shape, or form doing anything academic or professional a second monitor will make you 50% more productive anyway. So I highly recommend getting a second monitor, even if you're not in computer science or you're not using, using OBS. So after that initial hardware investment, which you may be able to get through MUN, or if you're a professor, you have like a startup grant, you have um, PDTER, which allows you to, to get that um, sort of hardware possibly. Um, you know, a decent webcam would be good. I have a, I like to invest in a like an actual microphone that that sounds nice for the recording. I don't know how well it comes over in WebEx, but when you do the local recording and put it on YouTube, it sounds really nice. Because um, it's it's really a shame when I think when professors, especially, you know, they spend thirty years learning a topic and then they're like recording it on an iPhone and you can barely understand what they're saying, right? So um, make that little bit of investment and learn how to use the software, and I think your lectures will be uh, much better. Or more, not better, but more enjoyable for the students, maybe.